Welcome to the Going North Podcast, where we will deliver you tips and techniques to advance yourself in anything you decide to do in life. I am your host, Dom Brinkman, and every Thursday, I will interview authors, especially self-published ones from various walks of life, who will deliver you information and inspiration to help you charge forward. On a quick side note, be sure to check out my book, Going North, on Amazon.com. It's available book paperback and audio book now let's get on with the show in today's episode of the going north podcast we have you guessed it another author but not just any author we have a fiction author who writes in the genres of historical fiction and romance and she also writes contemporary mysteries and children's books as well. So she is a lady of many talents indeed. She's been writing since 92, and she's written everything from legal analysis to a weekly newspaper column on religion. And you may be wondering, who is this wonderful person who likes singing, dancing, coaching, jump rope, and taking long walks with the two dogs? It is the wonderful Kate Dolan. How are you feeling today? <laughs> I'm great, but I have to admit when you said, are you wondering who this is? I was wondering, too. <laughs> yeah. It's funny when you hear a description of yourself or or anything else, sometimes you... uh you don't recognize yourself. I think we all tend to forget all the different aspects we have in our lives. Yeah, it it, it happens. It's like, oh, shoot, wait, or how do they know that? Wait, I actually do that? <laughs> yeah, it's almost like a mix of both. For sure. Yeah, so beyond a short introduction, could you fill in the gaps of where I may have missed and how you got to start with writing? So the short version of my life story, it occurred to me that I was born in Florida, but I've never lived there. But I think that somehow that actually has affected my life because I have always loved travel and I have always been really attached to the beach. So I guess that, that uh, experience in Florida has, has sort of affected my life and kind of steered the direction of it. And I think my parents' philosophy also has steered a lot of my life. Um, there's a commercial that's out now where they where they talk about there are two kinds of people in this world, the haves and the have-dones. Yeah. And my parents fell into that have-done category, and they wanted to, instead of having a fancy house, they wanted to take us on trips, take us out to dinner, take us to museums to experience things. And I find that that is now a very important part of my life, too, and something that I've tried to do with my own kids. My dad worked with NASCAR, and he traveled a lot, and we traveled along with him when we could. And that gave us some really unique opportunities that I think, especially as I got older, I realized, hey, not everybody gets to do this, and I want to take advantage of it while I can. And then as an, as I've gone along, that makes me realize all throughout life there are opportunities and brief windows of of opportunities or chances that we may never have again, and it's important to, to really take advantage of those. So one example of that is uh, my daughter is a competitive jump rope competitor. I, they say jump roper, and that drives my husband crazy. It's grammatically incorrect. So um, <laughs> in any case, we put some other things on hold to pursue some competitions at a national level because I realized those are opportunities that she's never going to have again, and I'll never have an opportunity to see those again. So that kind of philosophy of, you know, hey, let's, let's grab life and, and do what we can while we can is something that I'm realizing as I get older is important, and I need to, to keep that forefront in my mind. So as to how I got where I am now, uh, I went to college in D.C. after growing up in Illinois. I started out as a drama major, and after being around a lot of other drama majors, I realized uh, I wasn't really cut out for it. That wasn't really what I wanted. And I think what I wanted was the escapism, the chance to be somebody else, see the world through different eyes. And it wasn't until I had been around it for a while that I realized actually writing, writing fiction is the best way to get to do that. You can take 
a vacation to another place. You can be somebody else anytime you want to. And it took me a long time to realize that. But that's that's what I guess I really wanted was that escapism. Unfortunately, you it's hard to make a living as an escape artist. I worked in D.C. and discovered that I didn't like politics, so I ended up deciding to go to law school, thinking that that would be a good compromise between an academic pursuit and something practical. And while it was good training, I realized I also didn't want to be a lawyer. So I, at this point, my life was a, a collection of things that I didn't want to do. I didn't want to be an actor, didn't want to be a politics, didn't want to be a lawyer. Because I had training, I got a job as a legal editor. So there again, I got to hone my writing skills. And that was pretty boring, but it was a way to make a living writing. And then when I had kids, uh, everything changed. And I just jumped off that career ladder. And that never looked back, really. So as my kids grew up, I was able to incorporate some of my, it was able to make some time for writing and was also able to incorporate my um, passion for history, could take them, force them to go to every historical site in within a 200-mile radius, take them along on living history trips, doing camping at reenactments and, and things like that. And being a parent is probably the most creative and fulfilling thing that I ever could have imagined. So that kind of became my focus. And now that my kids are in college, I have had to reshift back more to what I want to be doing with my own life. So that's about where I am now. And that was the uh, probably the longest answer to any question that I've ever given. Hey, it's a okay. You, you dropped a lot of bombshells there, especially with the fact that you got to grab as much life as you can while you can. Yes. When my parents passed away, it really started me thinking about my mom was 74 when she died, and I realized, okay, if I die at the same age, I'm about two-thirds of the way through. What do I want to have done? What do I want, you know, what do I want to spend the rest of my time here doing? You know, I don't want to come home every day and say, oh, well, you know, my husband says, hey, how was, how was the day? And, oh, it was a day. I, I don't want to end that, end every day feeling like I was just another day that I had to get through. So it really had me re reprioritize things. And I want to try to look at each day as an opportunity. Now, sometimes I look at each day as an opportunity to get through my to-do list of laundry and, and uh, cleaning up after the dogs. But I really have to remember that we're not here to accomplish chores. We are here to live. And that is very important to me. So sometimes that cuts into my writing time. Very often it cuts into my writing time. But then it gives me more to write about and I figure at the end of the day or at the end of my life, physically, I may be limited in what I can do. But the ability to write, I think, will always be there. I hope will always be there. Very true indeed. Very true indeed. So it sounds like you may have had to overcome some trials besides chores and, well, I guess <laughs> maybe some of your actual time <laughs> when you got your, your law degree. So what advice would you give to someone who's looking to continue with their writing when life just gets in the way? Well, I think that one of the things that you need to decide as a writer is what your goal is because it's hard to have it all. And that kind of comes down to whether you want to write for fulfillment because you have it in you to create something and you are going to feel a sense of accomplishment and, and joy from writing, or if you're writing because you want to make money. Because there are two different approaches. If you are writing to create something, then you're going to want to find out what is the most fulfilling to you, what kind of creation you want to have. If you're writing to make money, you need to figure out what kind of writing is going to be most marketable for you, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, um, a combination of both. And then you're going to need to look at what the market wants. And a lot of advice says, you know, you can't write for the market. Well, you, you can't, like, try to predict, oh, I'm going to write this perfect, you know, vampire romance that's going to time at the exact point when people are really wanting to buy those books. But at the same time, you do have to look generally at what is selling 
And I'm not sure that people are interested in a romance from an aardvark's point of view, for example. Um, you have a much better chance of selling if you write it from point of view that more people are interested in reading. So you've got to, got to take a more market-driven approach. So the first thing I would say is, there again, figure out, figure out what your goal is and figure out what you need at the end of the day to feel satisfied with, whether it's selling X number of books or creating a book that you feel proud of and want, would want to give to uh, your grandmother. Yeah, that's true indeed. I mean, I'm not sure if anyone's grandmother wants to read about an aardvark love story. That would be, that'd be interesting. I'm not well, I think sure. maybe an aardvark's grandmother might want to, but ah, I am not sure how high they are on the list of, of um, Amazon purchasers. Hmm. Maybe I should try to write an aardvark love story and see what happens. I am not sure where that aardvark came from, actually. I'm sitting in an <laughs> office with pictures of animals all around me. I used to have a, a pet rabbit here in my office. I have never even really considered anything from an aardvark's point of view, so you just never know. I do think often, very often, that my writing comes from my subconscious mind, and boy, I don't know what's going on in there. <laughs> Sometimes it's you know, kind of scary. It's like the back of a closet. You just don't want to know what's there. <laughs> oh, it's just the boogeyman and his friends. Oh, I think it's yeah. It it it's a lot worse than that. Oh dang. <laughs> well, in terms of so what so when I mean worse, I mean there's probably cobwebs upon cobwebs and stuff hanging in there, and you know half destroyed, desiccated things, and and I'm terrified of spiders. So that kind of an image to me of the back of a closet and not knowing what's there and preferring to not know what's there is that that's where that comes from. Uh, the boogeyman, I I can take him. We did taekwondo together. I could take him any day. Haha, <laughs> this is very true. One of them roundhouse kicks, it's game over. Yep. But spiders, on the other hand, oh, man, forget it. You can use an axe kick with a shoe on. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned how writing is great for escapism. So what really inspired your love of just writing the romance and the historical fiction? Well, I'm a history nut. So I have always been fascinated by, I guess when I was a kid, I was fascinated by the fact that human nature hasn't changed, but the conventions of time have. So I saw saw the musical 1776 when I was a kid, and I was amazed at these figures that we see on coins and Mount Rushmore and these very serious people who did very serious, important things got frustrated and yelled at each other and made jokes, and they, and they were human. And, and to me, that was just eye-opening. And I wanted to kind of learn more about how people who did things in the past, how they were like us and how they were different and how they overcame the different types of challenges that they had. So I've been interested in how people did things in the past and what ways things were similar, what ways they were different, especially in the pre-industrial era. With that, every time I visit a historic site, a lot I would be thinking about, well, what if somebody did this there? How would people react to that? And Or what if you were in this situation? How would you how would you deal with it? So that's situations and visiting historic sites is kind of the inspiration for a lot of my stories. And, and it really, if you, if you love history, it really helps if you also like fiction because there is so much we don't know about a site or an event. We know the physical things that occurred and sometimes even those, the accounts of those differ tremendously. So you really have to fill in the blanks in your mind. And that's where it's very sh it's a very short journey from imagining the actual history to imagining the what if of history. And then you have a story. And so I, I love that. I love to read that. And I love to conceive of that in my own head. So that's that's where the history came in. The, the romance came in because, well, I think relationships are a, such an integral part of life. But when I first started to write fiction, I was thinking, well, this sounds kind of romancy. So I entered a romance contest, and I, I wrote to a romance author who was judging the contest and and asked for advice, and she steered me to a group called New England Romance Writers, and so I started going to their meetings, and I learned a lot about the process of writing, the craft of writing, and, and working towards getting published. 
And so that kind of steered me toward romance, but also at the same time I realized that a lot of what I was writing was not actually romance. So it's been kind of a mixed blessing for me. I was, I think, trying to fit my writing into something it wasn't, but I was writing romances that don't have romance in, in the rom- enough romance in them. I was writing mysteries that don't have any dead bodies. I guess I just don't really fit the marketable molds. And while I think that that makes me unique, it makes it really hard to market my books. Uh, so I guess they wanted more Highlanders and descriptive <laughs> language. <laughs> well, uh, to be perfectly honest, one thing that absolutely sells books is sex. And I can't bring myself to write sex scenes. I just feel like a voyeur. I, I will read them in other people's books, but it's not really the highlight of the story for me. If I wrote if I wrote books with a lot of sex in them, they would definitely sell better because that, that just does sell well. I kind of figure that people can use their own imagination and fill in what has happened and, and kind of get on with the story. And in terms of I guess mystery is the same thing. Everybody is expecting a, a, a death. And when I was writing my um, three-book mystery series, I didn't want to get involved with police procedures. And I couldn't really imagine a modern setting where the police are not involved intricately in investigating a murder. So I made my mysteries something that I thought a private investigator might handle. And also I, I tend to get off on kind of silly tangents. So there's a certain amount of silliness in there, and I thought that'd be rather disrespectful to be having people snarking about cookie crumbs while there's somebody's wife and mother is lying dead on the floor. So my strange sense of humor, I thought, really yeah, might not work so well with a serious story. I mean, you kind of brought up a uh, valid point with the... Uh... With the sex sells, I mean, sex sells and, I guess, procreation procreates money, right? <laughs> I have not heard that before, but, boy, it sure is true. <laughs> Maybe a romance mystery <laughs> where they find all the crooked crumbs over a dead body after <laughs> a bad sex sell. Yes. Well, my, the, the mysteries I wrote were actually, they were for a, a specialized line that was published, is a Christian publisher, so they had very strict guidelines about what could not be included. But they also wanted romance, so there had to be a Christian message, a romance, a mystery, certain other expectations because it was a cozy mystery, and it also had a pretty short word count. I think they originally around 62,000 words. So that was a lot to include in a pretty short space. And it amuses me now when I read reviews of on Amazon and so forth, and people will complain, well, there's, you know, it's a good story until, but there's, you know, why do these people feel compelled to put Christian messages in? And I was saying, well, that's because that's what part of the story is about. I mean, that's, and in my case, I try to make it pretty subtle because I have my characters really saying that, you know, my my lead character saying she's not a church person. This does not appeal to her. And it's her process of discovering that, that God does not live in a church, but, but that doesn't mean that you have to completely cut him out of your life and that it's not necessarily the strict type of, religion that she was brought up with. So I think that it's actually a fairly small part of my stories, but it is definitely there, and it's in the description of the book. So if anyone actually read the description of the book and did not want to deal with a Christian story, then they should pick up something else. Yeah, they probably saw the covers like, yeah, let me go ahead and pick up this book. Oh, I didn't look at the back of the book. Well, I'm going to complain anyway. Well, I guess you can't please everyone, and that's one thing that every writer really needs to understand, because even the most popular authors who sell trillions of books and have people falling all over themselves to get the next book, there are other people who just say, oh, I couldn't stand that. It was awful. And if if you can't handle that kind of reaction, it's going to be very difficult to be in the the publishing world or, or in any type of of creative endeavor. But that doesn't mean it's easy to hear people say they don't like your work, especially when instead of saying it as a personal opinion, oh, I didn't care for that, they might say, well, this sucks. 
this person can't tell a story and the you know the action was terrible this is bo- this is awful it should be used as a paperweight or a doorstop or fireplace kindling or something <laughs> it's like yeah it is very bad but it'll make a nice coaster for my drink <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like yep, yep. It'd make, you know, great paper to line the floor of the, your bird cage or something. So any advice for those maybe dealing with self-doubt in their hopes of writing and publishing their books? Well, everybody has a certain amount of self-doubt. And I think if you don't, then you're probably overconfident would be my guess. Um, it's a it's balancing, balancing act because you can't allow self-doubt to overwhelm you to the point where you are frozen and un- unable to do anything, um, especially because the most important thing you need to do is share your work with other people and get honest feedback because even the very best writers and the very best pieces still have room for improvement. And you need to get honest feedback to find out what that improvement could be. But on the other hand, you've got to not be scared to show your work. But on the other hand, if you you think that your work is great and you're real confident about it, then you're not going to let it be the best that it can be because you're not going to be open to change. So a little bit of self-doubt is good. Just don't let it paralyze you. And realize that everybody shares it. And that it, I think it ebbs and flows. I know with me, some days I'll just be ready to throw my pen and paper at the wall or smash my keyboard and say, I suck, why am I doing this? And then later on I'll go back and reread something and say, you know, that's not too bad. Maybe I'm not so bad at this after all. So it, it's going to, you're going to have your ups and downs. And if you're having a bad day of self-doubt, Put your work aside and go take a walk with the dog or go color in a coloring book or do something that frees up your mind in, in, in a different way and come back on a day when your self-doubt is, is at a much lower level. Sage advice indeed. Sometimes you just have to let the rage quit moment happen and go all somewhere and cool off. Mm-hmm. And then that's not just true of writing. I think that can be true of anything. We we all have times where we are more productive and other times where you're just wasting your time and you need to realize, okay, i got to stop and regroup or I'm just going to drive myself bananas. That's right. Don't want to do that. Might be susceptible to the monkeys and uh, folks who want some potassium. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, in your writing, I'm pretty sure you've done some reading as well. So, which book will probably be one that you recommend to others that is probably one of your all-time favorites? Heck, if you got five, you can list five. Well, of course, this is the trite answer. I would say the Bible is a pretty important one in my life, although really I think it's had more of an impact on me the way it has been shared through other people's interpretation rather than me reading it myself. Although I will say I, I started doing a, a Bible in a year program, which is where the Bible is broken up into daily readings that so you read through the course of the Bible in a year. And I started doing that when my son was in about first grade and he's in his senior year of college now. So I've read through the Bible quite a few times, partly as partly for inspirational help for myself and and partly as a historian and as a way to help understand what people knew in the past because very often if a family had any book at all it was the bible and they might read it every day so they would have that intimate familiarity with the language with the stories even the names become part of of their everyday life so in reading different different versions like the king james version it it helped me as a historian and writer to understand people of the past. But of course, my, my main focus in doing that was to help help understand, understand and, and develop my relationship with God. Although I got to say sometimes in, you know, the book of Deuteronomy, I find myself really challenged to be thinking of God instead of my shopping list or, or something else. But beyond that, I have a hard time pointing to some individual book. I will say all fiction in general helped me realize that 
all of us humans experience a lot of the same anxieties and heartaches in our life. And, and that was really comforting to me, especially when I was in middle school. I felt like I had all my friends turn on me and I just felt lost and alone. And in reading, I had that sense of connection with other people who were feeling the same way that I was and and realizing that we can all have that connection, not necessarily at the same time, but we all have those experiences. I think that was, that was hugely helpful and that, that had a, a really profound effect on me. And then, of course, you know, there's always that vacation from the ordinary that you get in fiction, too, and you can decide, hey, where do I want to go today? Who do I want to be today? And then realizing that that was part of my life goal, too, is to be able to just jump into that escapism world. That that had an effect on me quite a bit as well. Yeah, because, I mean, as you're going through life, it's especially if you're one of the folks who likes to watch the news every day, five times a day, you're going to need some kind of form of escapism because you'll just go crazy and you won't be inspired to do anything yes i do think i i do see some people who are obsessed with news as being just about paralyzed um and unable to do a whole lot else i will say if you study history that helps put things in perspective quite a bit people talk about living in difficult times and in many respects, I mean, we, we do have a lot of things clamoring for attention, and there are certainly difficulties in today's world. But compared to what some of our past ancestors have had to deal with, we have it so incredibly easy. I mean, just we're not watching half of our children die from disease before they're six years old. And we're not – most of us, certainly in the United States, don't have the fear that a, um, a marauding band of of raiders or an enemy army is going to come through and burn your wheat and you'll have nothing to eat and nothing to live on suddenly and they might take your house and put every you know turn you all into slaves and that that is that is something that people have had to live with in the past and some areas of the world still do but we don't and our lives are so much easier and we just don't realize that so i do think that studying the past can can give us a perspective that helps us get through the difficulties that we perceive ourselves having today. And that totally took it took me off the tangent of whatever it was you asked. So sorry about that. No need to apologize because it's very <laughs> true. I remember this motivational speaker, I think it was Greg Cardone, and he was talking about, hey, why, why are you complaining for? I mean, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, you didn't have a grocery store, and Caveman had to complain and said, oh, shoot, the bear almost ate me alive. <laughs> so like, you know yes, what? <laughs> yes, the daily life was a just a struggle to get basic shelter and food and water, and there are a few people in the world who still have to deal with that, but generally not in the United States. So I was, we can't complain, but sometimes we still do. Yeah, that's when you pull out the duct tape and the burlap sack and then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, on that happy note. So going off that inspirational goodness, what piece of advice would you give to yourself if you were 25 in 2017? Hmm. Well, let's see. I guess the first thing I'd tell myself is 30 isn't all that old, and neither is 40, so don't be worried about it. And you need to celebrate the people in your life, and I think if you have kids, it's natural to want to celebrate them and revel in them, but you also need to Pay attention to celebrate the joys with your other family members, siblings, parents, friends, because you're you're not always going to have these people in your life, and they may be gone very suddenly. And you want to spend time with them, enjoy time with them, make time for them. And that really is more important than anything on your to-do list. And I guess the other piece of advice I'd give myself is something I, I should put up on the wall and remind myself of all the time, which is control is an illusion. So if you feel like things are out of control, you just got to remember they're always out of control, and they're, you're never going to be in control. You just got to just gotta roll with the punches. I love that. Yeah, you should definitely just use 
just do that one day when you want to go really extravagant instead of a coloring book just get like this big fat canvas get some watercolor painting and just write control is an illusion yep but i would need to keep moving it around maybe i should do it on a computer so it can morph around and show up in different places because we do have a tendency to ignore good advice if it appears in the same place or comes from the same person over and over again you got to kind of hit yourself over the head with it you know what i got a better idea Write it on a sticky note, put it on your forehead, and then every time you wake up, make sure the sticky note is there. Woohoo! <laughs> well, then everybody else would see my advice. I'm not sure I would. <laughs> That's why I have to go in front of the mirror first. <laughs> Except when I look in the mirror. Yep. And then I'd see the advice backwards. Yep, it'll be great. <laughs> and then that'll be the illusion, right? <laughs> True. <laughs> Woo! Sage advice. So for those who want to get in contact with you and buy 10 copies each of all of your wonderful books, where can they do that? <laughs> well, I I have a website, which is katedolan.com. And if you go to kdhayes.com, that also, because my mysteries and the children's book that I wrote are all uh, written under the name K.D. Hayes because the style is so different because it's modern. Um, so... KDHayes.com or KateDolan.com both take you to my website. And I also kind of ebb and flow on using Facebook. Some days I'm on there quite a bit. Other days I'll ignore it entirely. But I have two Facebook pages. I have one for Kate Dolan as an author. And then the children's book that I wrote with my daughter is called Toto's Tale. And the publisher for that book set up a separate Facebook page. So on that Facebook page we focus on dogs because the story is from the dog's point of view and I love dogs and we also focus on jump rope because I co-wrote the book with my daughter and jump rope is a huge part of her life and so now it's become a pretty big part of mine as well so that that Facebook page has a little bit of a different flair to it I also do Twitter occasionally but probably Facebook and my website are the tools that I use to, to keep in touch with people the most so sweet. So that means y'all should go on ahead and find her on the Facebooks and the Twitters and then go on to the website and see all the book goodness. Sounds good to me. Woohoo! Well, thank you, Kate, for gracing us with your presence. We appreciate you. Well, thank you so much, Dom, for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for your time and your tuning ears to this wonderful episode. I hope you enjoyed yourself and got something out of it. Be sure to, once again, check out my book, Going North, on Amazon.com and CreateSpace.com. And if you'd like, feel free to follow me on social media at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all at Dom Brightman, YouTube at Dom Brightman. And if you want to connect on LinkedIn as well, I am there at Dom Brightman as well. Go out there.